Hello and welcome to today's PETA Town Hall meeting. I am Ben Williamson, PETA's Senior International Media Director, and I'll be co-hosting this event. Today I'm being joined by three distinguished PETA executives, PETA Senior Vice President Kathy Guillermo, Senior Vice President at the PETA Foundation and General Counsel to PETA, Jeff Kerr, and Jared Goodman, Peter Foundation Deputy General Counsel for Animal Law, for a special town hall to discuss new investigations, recent progress, and all of the innovative work of Peter's legal team. If you have access to a computer, you can stream this meeting at peter.org slash maytownhall. Once logged in, you can type in your question in the field at the bottom of your screen and listen to the town hall without using your telephone. If you're joining us on the phone at any time during today's town hall, you can press zero to ask a question. A PETA staff member will record your question and then put you back into the call so you can listen until you're able to ask it live a little later in our meeting. We're going to be discussing many, many areas of PETA's work today, so if for some reason we're unable to get to your question while we're on the call, we do promise to follow up with you directly in the coming days. And while we wait for everyone we're calling to join, a quick reminder that at any time during today's conversation, you can press 7 on your phone to make a much-needed donation to support all of PETA's vital work for animals. If you're joining us online, you can go to peter.org slash legal fund to make a gift as well. For those of you just joining us, welcome to today's Peter May Town Hall. My name is Ben Williamson, and I'm Peter's Senior International Media Director. And I'm responsible for bringing worldwide media attention to all of the vital work for animals we'll be discussing today. Peter Senior Vice President Kathy Guillermo will be on the line in just a moment to fill you in on a disturbing new Peter expose that is grabbing headlines around the world. A little later in our call, we'll be joined by Peter General Counsel Jeff Kerr and Peter Foundation Deputy General Counsel for Animal Law Jared Goodman, who will share some groundbreaking recent progress made by Peter's legal team. Kathy, Jeff, and Jared will all be here at the end answering your questions at the end of today's presentation as well, so do be sure to press zero on your phone to get your question in early. And I am hearing that most of those we're calling are on the line now, so let me turn things over to Kathy for more on an important new investigation that broke just last week. Kathy. Thanks, Ben, and hello to everyone joining us for today's town hall. If this is your first PETA town hall meeting, welcome. PETA holds these meetings every quarter or so to give our members an inside look at the new exposés and the groundbreaking victories that your support is making possible. If you've joined us before, I'm sure that you'll leave today's meeting inspired by all of the marvelous work for animals that Jeff, Jared, and I will discuss. Before we dive into PETA's legal work for animals, I'd like to give a few updates on a new PETA expose that's already making headlines in the U.S. and around the world. Most of you on this call probably remember the groundbreaking expose of horrific Chinese Angora rabbit farms released by PETA and PETA Asia a few years back. Footage from those cases of rabbits screaming in agony as their fur was ripped out by the handful has been seen by millions. And today, thanks to those exposés, the global trade in Angora is just a shadow of what it once was. That case led to more than 300 companies to pledge to drop Angora wool from their shelves and more are joining them all the time. Now we're working toward the same success in stopping another cruel and exploitative skins industry. The Washington Post just last week broke the news on a disturbing new PETA Asia investigation into the mohair you'll find in sweaters, blankets, and even in balls of yarn. This first-of-its-kind expose shows workers dragging, throwing, mutilating, and even cutting the throats of fully conscious Angora goats on farms in South Africa, which is the world's top mohair producer. The eyewitness documented heartbreaking abuse at all 12 of the Angora goat farms that they visited. Shearing is extremely stressful to prairie animals like goats, and the cries of terrors from defenseless goat kids as they're pinned down and shorn for the first time are haunting. Some shearers can be seen lifting angora goats up off the floor by the tail, which likely likely breaks the tail right at the spine. After shearing, 
Workers threw the animals across the wooden floor and they dragged them around by their legs. Now, much like the wool industry, shearers are paid by volume, not by the hour. So they're driven to work quickly and that means carelessly. Many goats were found suffering from bloody wounds on their face and ears after shearing. Some had broad swaths of their skin cut off. And workers crudely stitched the wounds right on the filthy shearing floor without providing the goats with any pain relief whatsoever. According to one farmer, our eyewitness met, at least 25% of goats on some of these farms will die before they're old enough to be sheared at six months of age. And it's tragic, but those goats may be the lucky ones. Shearing robs goats of their insulation, and that leaves them vulnerable to the cold and the wind and the rain. By one estimate, as many as 40,000 goats across South Africa died of exposure in a single weekend. Nearly all of the goats who managed to survive being sheared over and over again will eventually be sold for crude backyard slaughter and sliced apart with dull knives when they're just five or six years old. I'm sure that many joining us this evening, and even many in the fashion industry, had no idea about the cruelty of mohair before this latest expose broke. But now that it has, Peter is persuading companies to pull it from their lines almost as quickly as we did with the Angora Robert products. That certainly seems to be what's happening. Gap Inc. agreed to stop placing orders containing mohair for its Gap, Old Navy, Banana Republic, and Athleta lines after talking with PETA. The Arcadia Group, owner of Top Shop and seven other popular brands, also stopped pay- placing orders for mohair products after we contacted them. H&M and Inditex, one of the world's largest clothing retailers and the owner of Zara, have both also told us that they will ban mohair from their apparel brands by 2020. We'll be telling you much more on this new expose and updating you on the latest fashion giants to ban mohair during our special town hall meeting on the skins industry next month. In the meantime, I hope you'll join, you'll visit our website, sorry, and share this latest groundbreaking new PETA expose with your family and friends. Thank you, Kathy. I'm looking forward to hearing about many, many more companies ditching mohair when we have that town hall in the coming coming months. Um, and if you have any questions about this latest Peter expose or anything we're discussing during today's uh, town hall, please press zero on your phone. Kathy, Jeff, and Jared will be answering your questions live a little later during today's meeting. Kathy. Well, before we bring in Jeff and Jared to tell us more about PETA's innovative legal work, I have some great updates on our work for horses. One of the horses who ran during last weekend's Kentucky Derby shares his name with the audiobook company Audible. Weeks before the Derby, that company helped give horses like Audible a chance at a decent life after racing rather than a miserable journey to a slaughterhouse when it donated $15,000 to the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. Now, before the alliance was formed, half, of all thoroughbreds born in the U.S. ended up in Canadian or Mexican slaughterhouses once racing had cast them off. Today, the Alliance is the only aftercare organization supported by the entire thoroughbred racing industry, and and honestly, without PETA, it may never have been created. Back in 2011, a PETA eyewitness followed the miserable 1,100-mile journey of 33 horses from the kill pen at an auction in Iowa to a slaughterhouse in Quebec. The horses endured a grueling 36-hour trip in sub-freezing conditions. They were never given food or a sip of water or a chance to unload and rest. And the horses who slipped and fell while they were in transit had no way to get up or protect themselves from being trampled. After the release of that case, we went to the racing industry with a proposal and a working strategy for a retirement program, and they accepted it. By the next year, horse racing organizations, racehorse owners, jockeys, track owners, and stakeholders launched the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance as we had demanded, and this has spared thousands and thousands of horses. But while the U.S. thoroughbreds now have a better chance at a peaceful retirement today, some still end up in slaughterhouses when they stop winning or are too injured to run. Funding is crucial for this project, so PETA stepped in again we proposed a pop-up screen concept for betting terminals that allows bettors to donate a portion of their winnings to the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. A major track owner accepted it, 
The software was developed, and I'm happy to share that it's in place in tracks in California, Florida, and New York, and it will soon be used across the country. And it's making thousands and thousands of dollars to help support these horses every day. And this isn't the only way that Pete is changing things for horses. For years, we've been working to end the illegal doping and over-medication of horses, a practice among owners and trainers that's led to countless injuries, broken bones, and fatal breakdowns right on the racetrack. I know that many of you might remember our expose of Steve Asmussen, one of the most prominent trainers in horse racing, which revealed that he misused drugs so that he could keep injured horses running. Because of this expose, federal legislation to regulate medication is now pending. Prominent tracks have introduced major reforms, and New York has enacted sweeping new regulations. But there's a lot more to be done, and here's one new way that we're tackling it, by working with betters. Today, if a horse tests positive for illegal drugs, the race results can be adjusted, and the prize money can be redistributed, but for the betters, there's no recourse. The money's gone. That's the end of the story. We believe doping amounts to illegal race fixing and fraud. So when a better approached us, we got busy. I should say our lawyers got busy. In March, the better filed suit against a New Jersey horse trainer alleging violations of federal and state racketeering laws and against both the owner and the trainer for fraud, arguing that the doping of a trotting horse named Tag Up and Go with the banned substance erythropoietin was race fixing. Tonight, we're talking about the many ways that PETA's legal work is pushing the envelope, and we think that this new suit will soon open the floodgates, leading to the potential for hundreds of similar lawsuits from cheated bettors, and someday, the end of doping of horses on racetracks entirely. Ben? Thank you for that update, Kathy. Um, And all of the work that we're discussing today, from the first ever exposés of the fashion industry to precedent-setting legal victories for animals, is only made possible through the support of caring members, caring members like Bruce and Rita in Deerfield, Wisconsin, who have donated $50. Thank you, Bruce and Rita. Patrick in Brooksville, Florida, $25. Thank you, Patrick. And Louise in Gresham, Oregon, $100. Thank you so much. If you find yourself inspired by all that you're hearing during this event, uh, please consider pressing 7 on your phone right now and making a generous gift as well. And if you're watching us online, you can visit peter.org slash legal fund, all one word, and make a gift there as well. However you choose to give, your donation is always deeply appreciated. Yes, that's right, Ben. We can definitely use your support, so please consider pressing 7 on your phone. And now I'd like to introduce Jeff Kerr, General Counsel to PETA and Head of PETA's Foundation's Philip J. Hirschkopf Legal Department, which, with 19 attorneys, is the largest and most effective legal team working for animal rights in the world. Jeff worked tirelessly to build the PETA Foundation's legal department from the ground up, bringing in some of the brightest and most compassionate legal minds he could find, including PETA Deputy General Counsel for Animal Law, Jared Goodman, whom we'll introduce in a moment. Jeff's team is so accomplished that in 2017, they were named Best Legal Department of the Year by the prestigious Corporate Counsel Magazine, uh, only the second nonprofit and the first ever animal group to receive that distinction. For more than 25 years, Jeff has been a pioneer in the struggle to achieve fundamental rights for animals, from defeating unconstitutional ag-gag laws to proposing that orcas be considered persons and so much more. He and his team are expanding justice for animals around the world, and I'm really happy to have him here with us today. Jeff? Thanks very much, Kathy, and hello, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. PETA's legal team uses the law to create real change for animals. And rather than stick within the narrow borders of what's already been litigated, we blaze new trails redefining how the law considers animals and their rights. Here's just a handful of some of the legal precedents that we've put in the history books. When protesters have been sued uh, using laws that were designed to fight organized crime, the U.S. Supreme Court adopted PETA's argument and struck down that ruling. We also won the first state Supreme Court decision, as well as the first British case, upholding the right to film animal abuse with a hidden camera 
and to publicize that video. One area where we've seen some great progress is with so-called ag-gag bills. Now, you've probably all heard about these. This is legislation designed to stop anyone from documenting animal abuse on farms and in slaughterhouses, and they're insidious. As you know, PETA has performed investigations since our inception, and we absolutely will not be locked out. So through hard legal maneuvering, we've been able to stop these bills from making it to the governor's desk in 19 states. In four states where they were passed into law, we've filed lawsuits. And in 2014, we made history when we won our lawsuit against the state of Idaho. And for the first time ever, a court declared an ag-gag law unconstitutional. We got our second win in 2017 against Utah when another federal court held its ag-gag law to be unconstitutional, too. Now, we have a lawsuit pending against North Carolina, and our lawsuit against Iowa got a green light when the court refused the state's attempt to have it dismissed. That state may be the target of our most recent ag-gag suit, but it certainly won't be the last. Whenever those who abuse and exploit animals attempt to use these dangerous bills to shield their cruelty, PETA's legal team is going to do all we can to challenge, to challenge them. Excuse me. Ben, I think you wanted to chime in? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, I wanted to say that the legal maneuvers needed to overturn our gag laws obviously aren't easy or inexpensive, and that's why I hope that you'll take a brief moment to press 7 right now to give our legal work an immediate boost before they take on their next ag gag case. Jeff. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, now, while PETA has always used eyewitness investigations to help expose and stop abuse, another crucial way that we learn about animal abusing facilities is by searching their USDA or U.S. Department of Agriculture inspection and other records, which until now have been available on the USDA website. But last year, something terrible happened. A lot of the important information that was online for years, things like how many animals are caged at each facility and the ways in which workers have been cited for abusing and neglecting animals, is just gone. And without those records being publicly available, animal abusers in thousands of zoos, circuses, laboratories, puppy mills, and other facilities – can shield their behavior from public scrutiny. So we're now suing the USDA to compel it to release those vital records. And Jeff, sorry to interrupt you here, but can I give an example of why that USDA lawsuit is so important? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, please. Well, right now, the only way in which the public can obtain access to these thousands of Animal Welfare Act enforcement records is by submitting separate Freedom of Information Act requests for each one which the agency then takes months or even years to process. And so here's a great example. In March of 2016, PETA submitted a request for records relating to a USDA inspection of a really notorious roadside zoo after we learned of a report that it had been cited for violating five Animal Welfare Act standards. Nearly two years later, the agency finally responded by refusing to hand over 38 of the 49 pages related to the inspection and incredibly blacking out most of the other 11 pages, including details from the inspection report that had previously been posted on its own website. The agency's reasoning for the censorship, and I have to quote this, revealing the inspection findings could cause embarrassment, harassment, and other stigma to the licensee, end quote. When a federal agency thinks that the potential embarrassment of an animal abuser comes before revealing details of their abuse, things have to change, and very quickly. That's absolutely right, Kathy, and we're doing everything we can to, to force that change as quickly as possible. Another way that PETA's lawyers protect animals is by protecting PETA itself from our opponents. We are not always the one filing lawsuits. We've had some major players try to take us down, too. PETA was the first organization, for example, to launch an international campaign against cruelty in the wool industry. 
And in Australia, where most of the world's wool comes from, we exposed a practice called mulesing, which is when huge strips of flesh are cut from lamb's hindquarters with no pain relief. After we were able to convince Liz Claiborne, H&M, and dozens of other major retailers to stop selling wool for mules cheap, the world's largest wool trade group sued us to make us stop, but it didn't work. Eventually, they not only had to withdraw their lawsuit, they also had to fast-track alternatives to mulesing because we got the industry to agree to phase it out. And it's, and it's not just the Australian wool industry who've tried and failed miserably at silencing us. A few minutes ago, Kathy brought up Steve Asmussen, the prominent horse trainer who was at the center of uh, that major PETA investigation around the misuse of drugs to keep injured horses running. Well, he came after us too. But not only did we successfully fight off his lawsuit, our expose resulted in major drug restrictions and some of the other horse racing industry reforms that Kathy talked about earlier. Ben? Thank you, Jeff. I just wanted to say a big, big thank you to Jean D. in Worcester for her donation of $20, to Joan K. in London, Ontario, $100, uh, John in Mo Monroeville, PA, thank you so much, $100, Susan in Cambridge, Massachusetts, $100, Michael in Florida, $100. Thank you, guys. Uh, Deborah in Roaring Brook, $25. Letitia in Jackson Heights, New York, $50. Wonderful. Thank you. And wow, Patricia in Boston, I think, $500. Thank you so much, everybody. It really means so much to us. Um, we've got some great questions coming in already from our members on everything from the monkey selfie case to the ag gag bills we've been discussing. So remember, if you'd like to get your question in during today's town hall, you just have to press zero at any time. A PETA representative will jot your question down and put you in our queue to ask it live just a little later in today's meeting. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Ben. PETA is at the forefront of the global animal rights movement, but I want to make clear that we're not saying animals should have the same rights as humans, like the right to vote, for example. What we're saying is that they should have appropriate rights to protect their needs and interests. And that's a very important point to keep in mind the next time you're asked about our work, or perhaps you're asked about someone like Naruto. Um, those of you who are joining us online uh, are seeing right now um, a photograph of a handsome fellow whose rights we fought for. He is a crested macaque named Naruto who lives in the jungle in Indonesia. Well, one day he picked up a photographer's unattended camera and took several photos, including the now famous monkey selfie. But the photographer published the photo and claimed that he owned the copyright. So that's when PETA stepped in. Look, Naruto didn't accidentally trigger the camera. He did it intentionally. Experts have been observing his troop of macaques for years, and they'll tell you these monkeys are extremely intelligent, and they're fascinated by their reflections. They even grab motorbike mirrors and stare at themselves. So it was clear that when Naruto saw the camera lens, he recognized his own reflection. And when he clicked the shutter, he saw the reflection change, and he purposely clicked it again and again, making a different face each time. Now, in this situation, the law is clear that the one who takes the photo owns the copyright. It doesn't matter whose camera it was. And nothing in copyright law prohibited an animal from owning a copyright. So we sued on Naruto's behalf, asking the court to award the copyright in the photos to Naruto and to allow PETA to administer the copyright for his benefit, as well as his community of macaques who are critically endangered from being killed illegally for bushmeat and from human encroachment that's destroying their habitat day by day. We were able to obtain a settlement with the photographer who agreed to donate 25% of any future gross revenue that he derives from using or selling any of the monkey selfie photos, to registered charities that are dedicated 
to protecting the welfare or habitat of Naruto and the other crested macaques in Indonesia. As a result of this case and that settlement, a prominent BBC and National Geographic wildlife photographer was inspired to donate a portion of his profits from now on to wildlife protection uh, to benefit his subjects, and we believe this will have a snowball effect. This groundbreaking case, as you can imagine, has now sparked a massive international discussion about the need to extend fundamental rights to animals for their own sake, not in relation to how they can be exploited by humans. The suit is being taught in law schools across the country, and it lit a fire in legal circles around the world. We were invited to speak about it at a Copyright Society conference. I presented it at Harvard Law School earlier this semester. It was featured in This American Life, the well-known national public radio show that some of you may have heard. And now, late breaking news, it may even be made into a movie. Although we didn't win this time, this was the first case that asked the court to declare an animal to be the owner of intellectual property rather than declaring the animal to be an owned piece of property himself. And it represents the first time that an animal will benefit financially from a work of his own creation, which is huge. And that's not the only way that we're pushing the envelope for animals. Everybody knows, I think, that the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution outlaws the condition of slavery. Um, but it doesn't state that it applies exclusively to human beings. So we sued SeaWorld for holding wild-caught orcas as slaves in violation of the 13th Amendment. We were supported by the preeminent constitutional scholar Lawrence Tribe. And even though we lost, the case marked the very first time a U.S. court had ever considered constitutional rights for animals. It also created huge and ongoing debates in the press and in law schools about the ethics of captivity. Now, I want to emphasize something here, and that we're not disheartened by losing these cases, and let me tell you why. PETA began with just one lawyer, Phil Hirschkopf, the legendary civil liberties attorney who my department is named in honor of, as you heard Kathy mention a little bit ago. If you've seen the film Loving, which is about the landmark case Loving versus Virginia, you'll know that Phil was the lawyer who won the Supreme Court case that legalized interracial marriage. Well, after the 13th Amendment case was decided, Phil reminded me that in these civil rights battles, just like the human civil rights battles of the 1960s and 70s, you lose, you lose, you lose, and then you win. And we will win, certainly, with your help. Now, I'd like to take a moment to introduce my colleague, Jared Goodman. As the PETA Foundation's Deputy General Counsel, Jared works on everything from eyewitness investigations and litigation to shareholder resolutions. His many high-profile cases include the SeaWorld 13th Amendment case I just mentioned. His work to persuade the California Coastal Commission to require SeaWorld to stop breeding orcas in San Diego, and overseeing groundbreaking exposés of the cruel pigeon racing industries in both the United States and Taiwan that resulted in the greatest number of individuals ever charged as a result of a PETA investigation. Jared? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, before we talk about a few of the many, many animals our team has helped in recent months, I want to give you an update on a campaign that I know is deeply important to many of you, as it is to me. I'm sure many joining us today are familiar with an orca named Lolita. She's been imprisoned at the Miami Sea Aquarium for over 45 years, and PETA's racing the clock to free her before she dies. We had a breakthrough when a PETA lawsuit and formal petition forced the government to stop excluding her from the protections of the Federal Endangered Species Act. After those protections were in place, we then sued the Miami Sea Aquarium for violating the act, and then we had a setback. That lawsuit was dismissed by the district court. So we appealed, and another setback. 
a three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit down in Miami rejected our appeal, and we're now asking the entire appeals court to reconsider the case supported by a brief that was submitted by some of the world's foremost cetacean scholars and researchers. Even the city of Miami Beach is on our side. The city council unanimously passed a resolution pushing for Lolita's release. The obstacles look overwhelming, and there is a chance that Lolita won't live long enough to make it out of her tiny tank. But with your support, we're doing all we can to win the day for her and hopefully establish a precedent for other animals in captivity. Ben? Thank you. As Jared just mentioned, it really is your support that drives all of our life-changing work for Lolita and other animals. And I just want to name some of the people who have contributed tonight for that work. Barbara in Washington, D.C. donated $100. Thank you, Barbara. Angela in Roxbury, New York, $75. Rita in Glendale, Arizona, $100. Larry in Victoria, British Columbia, $50. Harshad in Ontario, California, $125. Um, our own Steve Curley from D.C. gave $100. Thank you so much, Steve. Bonnie in Woodbridge, VA, uh, 35 Lisa T. in North Carolina, 15 And Julie R. in Newport, $50. Thank you all so much. This is really amazing. And please uh, give all of the work that we're discussing tonight an immediate boost right now by pressing 7 on your phone or visiting peter.org slash legal fund and donating. Thank you. Jared. Thanks, Ben. Uh, while we are continuing to work for Lolita's release, if possible, maybe even back into her family pod in the Pacific Northwest, we're also doing all we can for bears and other species who are abused for photo ops, especially lion and tiger cubs. We're currently suing a particularly cruel roadside zoo in Indiana called Wildlife in Need, which is an accurate but ironic name because what the animals are in need of is rescue from this place. The company is owned by Tim Stark. For years, he's torn baby tigers and lions away from their mothers, declawed them, and held what he called tiger baby playtime events where the cubs were passed around for public encounters and photo ops, all situations that are extremely stressful for them. We're suing Stark for violating the Endangered Species Act. Declawing actually means amputating the toes at the last joint, and it's against federal law to do it to big cats. Even two weeks after the procedure, two of the cubs at Stark Zoo were crying, bleeding, and hesitant to walk. They died soon after, almost certainly as a result of the procedure. And all declawed big cats are left with acute wounds and the risk of chronic lameness, pain, and psychological distress. Now there's been a very exciting development in our lawsuit. The court has granted our request for a preliminary injunction. That's an extraordinarily, that's an extraordinary form of relief that's issued when a court finds that irreparable injury will result without it. This order immediately stops Tim Stark from declawing any more cubs, separating from their mothers, or holding any tiger baby playtime events. This is a huge and unprecedented breakthrough. It puts us closer to our goal of not only shutting down wildlife in need and making sure that all the animals are retired to sanctuaries, but of shutting down all cub encounters across the country. Jeff? Thanks, Jared. And picking up on the theme Jared was just talking about, I know some of you may be familiar with our expose of Dade City's Wild Things, but here's a refresher. We're currently involved in another Endangered Species Act lawsuit against this roadside zoo, which has been particularly brazen. The owners of Dade City's Wild Things had refused to let us enter the facility for a court-ordered inspection. Well, when we returned with federal marshals and were allowed in, all of the tigers had been moved. Most of them were shipped to another notorious animal abuser, this one in faraway Oklahoma. And this was right after a federal judge 
had issued an injunction against moving them. In the transport truck, the Tigers suffered for days in the sweltering heat with no climate control. And en route, a tiger gave birth to three cubs, and all three of them died. Here's something else that will give you an idea of the caliber of people we're dealing with. Prompted by another of our complaints, the state of Florida filed suit against Dade City Wild Things, alleging that the owners spent hundreds of thousands of donors' dollars on their own personal expenses, including their son's wedding, the same son who recently pleaded guilty to sexual misconduct and indecent exposure involving a child. Well, anyway, since the incident with the federal marshals, we've won some major victories in the case. We won the release of all 19 Dade City Tigers, but that's not all. We also got out other animals from that awful Oklahoma facility, including 20 more ailing tigers, three black bears, and two baboons, all of whom are now in reputable sanctuaries, and I'm happy to say thriving. We also filed a motion to hold Dade City's wild things in contempt of court for all those shenanigans I talked about just a minute ago. Currently, there are two other motions that need to be dealt with before we get a final ruling from the presiding judge. And if we win, it will likely mean that Dade City's wild things can never possess tigers again. And even more importantly, it will create the first legal precedent prohibiting the premature separation of tiger cubs from their mothers, as well as tiger cub photo ops, which is the main cause of the captive tiger overpopulation crisis in the U.S. That's yet another reason that we're so grateful for your support today. If we're successful, this suit would pave the way toward eliminating one of the most critical welfare issues for captive tigers. We really are grateful. Um, we're grateful to everyone who's donated tonight. And uh, specifically, we've had some more donations from Kyle in Boothwin, PA, $50. Thank you so much, Kyle. Judy F. in New York State, $100. Marina in Bangor, Maine, $100. William from Marina del Rey, which is close to here, $30. Thank you so much, William. And Tova B. in LA, $52. Thank you so much, all. This is really, really generous. Um, just before Kathy comes back to help wrap up tonight's discussion with news on a terrific new rescue, a quick reminder to hit zero to ask a question of Jared, Jeff, or Kathy about any of the topics that we're discussing tonight or anything else that happens to be on your mind. They'll be answering your questions live in just a few minutes. Thank you, Ben. Both Jeff and Jared spoke about some of the amazing progress for animals PETA's legal team has accomplished, and I'd like to end tonight's town hall by introducing you to five wonderful animals PETA's legal team helped just last week. Until recently, Andy, Cindy, Barney, Bucky, and Brock spent their lives being hauled around the country in tiny trailers, forced to roll barrels and pose for photos with humans as part of a traveling bear show. And, of course, bear training is always barbaric. There are only a few of these archaic acts left in the country, thank goodness, and PETA is working tirelessly to shut them all down. Almost as soon as the bears left their transport cages, they bounded into this lovely new sanctuary habitat. They began playing, and it was a terrific introduction to the place where they will spend the rest of their lives finally living like real bears. In the past five years alone, PETA has rescued 72 bears from hellish places, and I'm certain there will soon be even more. Everything we accomplished for animals from helping five long-abused bears begin a new life to winning precedent-setting legal challenges happens because of your support. So thank you once again for your compassion and your commitment to PETA's work. As Ingrid is fond of saying at the end of our town halls, we simply couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, it looks like we're ready to take a few questions from our listeners. So let's begin with Jan in Texas, who has a question about Tamu. Jan, are you on the line? Hi. Um, this is Jan Brown in Texas. And I had a question about, I know at Texas A&M, um, there was a program there where they were using golden retrievers 
to, uh, well, supposedly do research for muscular dystrophy, I believe, or I, I'm not sure which one it is, but maybe it was the MS. But I wanted to know, has that stopped? Because I've heard different, uh, you know, some said they have, they haven't. I just wanted to know if you had an update on that. Well, I can answer that question for you. Um, yes, that campaign continues. We're a little uncertain about what exactly is going on at the university because the university is a very accomplished liar and they've given differing stories. We do know that they have discussed closing the laboratory in response to our campaign, but they are fighting us tooth and nail on all open records requests. So we don't have the final story on what is happening and what their plans are. We continue a very strong campaign and we know that we have got them up against the wall, so to speak. And they're, they're very concerned about the dropping support for the university because of it. And just for those of you who aren't familiar with that campaign, it is muscular dystrophy experiments. They purposely breed golden retrievers and other dogs to, to exhibit some of the symptoms that are similar to human muscular dystrophy. Of course, it's not the same disease. And that's why 37 years of these horrible experiments have not yielded any effective treatments and certainly not a cure for muscular dystrophy. And if you go to PETA.org, you can see the video that came out of that lab, and you can see also video of some of the people who have muscular dystrophy themselves and who are joining us in this campaign to end these atrocious experiments. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Jan, for your question. Um, let's have another question. Uh, Graciela, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Graciela in West Hollywood has a question for Jared about Lolita. Graciela. Yes, I was. Uh, I had put a question about the status of Lolita's case and has most of it been answered already by uh, your comments. But I wanted to know about the... the oh, it sounds like we've lost Graciela. Oh, I'm so sorry. Jared, perhaps you can just give us a, a, a quick recap on where we stand with the leader's case now for Graciela, and hopefully we'll get her back. Yeah, certainly. Um, so right now uh, we are waiting for the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals down in Miami to rule on our petition for rehearing on the case because uh, we firmly believe that the Court of Appeals got it wrong uh, and it's inconsistent with prior Supreme Court precedent. Um, so we're, we're asking the full court to reconsider its decision uh, in, in light of that precedent. Thank you, Jared. Um, we should have Dawn in California on the line. Dawn, what's your question, please? Uh, yeah, I wanted to know um, when you have these victories and pe like for the the skinning of the animals for fashion fur, um, and you've had a victory, and but why does the ban have to go on until 2020? Why won't they like stop now? I think I can take that question, yeah. sure. Yes, if you're talking about, for example, the mohair. Um, well, the, the short answer is that the companies are enormous, and sometimes things are in motion that they, they have to do quite a bit to stop. So they need, in other words, to get in touch with hundreds and hundreds of retailers, and um, they need to get things organized so that they can stop it. In some cases, they may... Uh, stop ordering it immediately but sell out what they have and yet put a time limit on it. The main thing that we need them to do is to stop ordering it right away, and that's what the companies are doing. That's what will we'll, we'll take the bottom out from the industry. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Dawn, for your question. Um, we're ne now going to hear from uh, Val in South Carolina, I believe. Val, what's your question, please? I was just wondering what the ultimate fate of the Ringling Brothers elephants uh, turned out to be. Uh, I didn't hear anything else, uh, and it's just been a little bit of unfinished business in my mind. Where are they? I can. This is Jeff. I can take a shot at that one. Um, thank you for the question. They are mainly at the... Uh, misnamed, misleading, misleadingly named Center for Elephant Conservation, uh, that is uh, the Feld Corporation's uh, base in Florida. 
uh, and they are still trying to find ways to exploit these animals, including by using some of their uh, bodily fluids and tissues potentially in uh, experimentation. So we are still trying and fighting to try to force them to send the animal, the elephants, and the uh, and all the other animals for that matter to reputable sanctuaries. Um, it's it is difficult, um, but we haven't forgotten them. Um, but um, you know, certainly it was a great victory to get the circus shut down after 146 years. So those uh, animals aren't being uh, trucked, trained, and trailered on, uh, on on the roads and all around the country. Um, but but that's the the latest status of those animals. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, it's um, sometimes you, these things fall out of the news, um, but you can be sure that Peter and and Jeff's legal team are working behind the scenes, making sure that they're um, you know they're kept safe. I want to go to another question now from Bob in Massachusetts. Bob, are you on the phone? Bob, are you there? No? Um, okay, I have a question that was uh, sent online uh, from Stephanie in Gainesville, uh, who has a question for Jeff. Um, what do you think is the most important takeaway from the monkey selfie suit? Jeff. That's a, that's a great question. There are so many different answers. Um, I, I think... From the animal's perspective, from Naruto's perspective, I think the most important thing is that it put front and center the fact that these animals are incredibly complex and he, like others, can create their own intellectual property. They are capable of creating copyrightable works, um, and that is an, a very important step as we try to prepare the path toward the day when – appropriate rights, as I mentioned uh, uh, a little earlier, appropriate rights for animals are determined. Uh, one of the most important legal aspects of the case uh, in the court's recent decision was they did reaffirm, even though um, they wouldn't award Naruto the copyright, they did reaffirm that animals have what's called legal standing to bring a lawsuit under the U.S. Constitution. That's huge. Um, and that's something that, that that's very important. Thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you, Stephanie, for your question. Um, we have another question now from Bob in Massachusetts, um, who wrote, why is the USDA censoring those abuse reports? Is there anything PETA members can do to help them get, get to help get them back online? Um, Kathy, maybe you can take this one. Yes, and I think Jeff might chime in here, too, on this one. I, I think it's a good question. We have seen for many years the USDA has been trying to uh, prevent people from making their work harder. Uh, they, they look on these animal-using facilities as their clients. I believe they even call them their clients and not as the bodies that, that they are supposed to make sure are following the laws. Um, so every time we get information about abuses and we make uh, a fuss about that, and or I should say more properly, we campaign against that and get the animals out of harm's way, it makes their job a little harder. Um, and I hate to say it, but it seems to be laziness to me. And I think from a legal perspective, Jeff, Jeff may have a different thought on that too. Yeah, I think it really is um, an inherent conflict of interest that the USDA has in their law enforcement role. Um, Kathy alluded to it. To give you an idea, the enforcement division that is responsible for ensuring that the Animal Welfare Act is enforced is in the USDA's marketing department. And as Kathy said, they treat these exhibitors um, as their clients. That's crazy. That's like the FBI saying that the mafia is one of its clients. Um, and so there really is no justifiable reason uh, other than they're trying to prevent people, organizations like PETA foremost among them, from learning this information um, so that they can, so that we can make life difficult for those exhibitors and for the USDA. And you should know the USDA has been on the receiving end of several of our lawsuits and literally thousands of complaints 
uh, over the years about their abject failures to do their job properly. Um, and that's why, you know, we're not letting up. As far as what can PETA members do to help get them back online, uh, do get in touch with your congressmen, your senators in Washington. Um, they have the ability to pressure, to write to the USDA, to write to the Secretary of Agriculture. That information is available online. Uh, and express that you are outraged by it and that these documents should be put back up online where they have been for years and where they belong. Thank you, Jeff and Kathy. Um, we have another web question now uh, from Patricia in Illinois who asks, what is the most difficult case anyone on the legal team has worked on for Peter? Jeff, maybe you'd like to tackle this one. <laughs> Hello. Well, uh, yeah, the every case where we're trying to stop abuse is difficult um, because we have such an urgency um, and such an obligation to try to stop that abuse as quickly as we possibly can. Um, that's first and foremost um, uh, uh, among among the difficult uh, the difficulty of these cases. The biggest issue that we have, and it's not limited to any one case, is trying to establish, I talked about it a little earlier, trying to establish what's known as legal standing for animals uh, to be able to sue in their own right. Believe it or not, the courts have, have made decisions saying that even animal protection laws that are designed to protect the animals themselves, they're specifically designed for that purpose, does not entitle the animals to be the plaintiffs in lawsuits. So what you have to do is you have to find standing among organizations like PETA, uh, supporters like those of you on this call, um, or, or other people who have some kind of connection to the animals on whose behalf we're trying to sue. Um, it, it can sometimes be a very uphill task, and that's why – when you look back at cases like the 13th Amendment and the monkey selfie, we are trying to, if you will, kick the door open, kick the legal door open to demonstrate to the courts why these animals deserve standing to sue in their own right. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Patricia, for your question. Um, we have another web question now uh, from Matt in Albany. Who, uh, who says, I remember seeing an awful baby tiger photo op at a mall when I was growing up, and I'm amazed that this is happening. How common are these photo ops with baby animals in the U.S., and what can I do if I spot one? Jared, any thoughts on this question? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. It is definitely a way that each and every one of you on this call can help. Um, these photo ops aren't incredibly common anymore um, in large part because people recognize that uh, you should not be interacting with wild animals because it's both dangerous to uh, the person and the animal because of disease transmission and all of the things that we discussed earlier about declawing. Um, but one thing that anyone could do is if they see photo ops like this at a mall or elsewhere, um, simply take a photo of what's going on, and if um, you can identify if there's a sign or something like that, who the exhibitor is, so if it is Tim Stark or Wildlife in Need offering these, and just send them along to PETA at info at PETA.org, then our team can look into it uh, and ensure that any laws that are being broken, such as the Endangered Species Act for declawing cubs or uh, local laws related to, um, to exotic animal possession, anything being violated uh, will ensure is enforced and do all we can to enforce it. And we've actually had a great deal of success there. And recently there was one particular exhibitor um, whose mall uh, storefront in Oklahoma City was shut down after we submitted a complaint and also animals were confiscated in Nevada following PETA complaints. Um, so simply getting it on our radar will enable us to look into it and try to obtain those same results. 
And if uh, if I could jump in uh, to add, to add to what Jared said, um, also a very important aspect is for each person individually to never be silent uh, and speak up while you're there and encourage people to to not go to to have these tiger photo ops, these baby baby tiger photo ops. Tell them to stay away. Tell them what's wrong with it. Um, and go if, if you see it at a shopping center parking lot, complain to the to the shopping center owner. If you see it in a mall, complain to to the mall owner. Um, and I, I mentioned it a little bit ago, but I think it bears repeating. These photo ops, w- where people are having their pictures taken with supposedly adorable little tiger cubs and and bear cubs, for that matter is the number one problem creating tiger overpopulation in this country because they will these these exhibitors will uh, exploit these animals by breeding them using the cubs for a short time while they're uh, still small and can be handled uh, and then once they outgrow the ability of the people to to force them to sit still for photographs they languish in these horrible roadside zoos like we've been talking about, like Dade City's Wild Things and Wildlife in Need and the Oklahoma facility that I talked about. So stopping those photo ops is critical to ending tiger overpopulation in this country. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have uh, time for one last question. So uh, we should have on the line Gloria. Gloria, what's your question, please, to to finish us off here? Thank you for taking my call. I live in uh, Venice, Florida, and I can certainly write a letter into our local paper regarding the ringling uh, elephants, and I'm going to do that as a result of the webinar. Um, My call had to do with that these people are in the business of making money, and how can we most effectively distribute uh, how can we most effectively decrease the demand on the part of the consumer? I can spend literally three hours a day writing emails to people, signing petitions. I distribute literature from PETA. I post literature on my locker at work. I talk it up and down the line. But what do you find most effective? I would guess not being silent when you see it occur. I think this is Kathy. I think that is the most important thing. I think silence is the one thing that will ensure that nothing changes. And it's amazing how many people one person can touch by sharing the story of what's happening to animals and asking them to become involved and showing how important it is. That's that's how we've grown from a few people in the basement in Maryland of an apartment to an international organization with six and a half million supporters who who help us make it run. It all comes from speaking up and whenever you can, doing what you can. I think that's right. I'd like this is Jeff. I'd like to just add one other thing there too. And Gloria, everything that you're doing is wonderful. Um, and I echo what Kathy said. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to sign up for our action alerts at PETA.org. Um, if you'll permit me to give you a little bit of an anecdote, um, when we send out action alerts, because all of you are so involved, we will get, and this is not an exaggeration, we will get hundreds of thousands of people in a matter of just a few days emailing or calling places that are doing terrible things to animals. And uh, this is one of my favorite parts of the job because I'm the one that usually gets the angry phone calls from the company or from the company's lawyer saying, you're uh, harassing us, you're, you're, you've crashed my, my email server, um, and it's harassment. And I get to tell them, no, it's not. This is the letter-writing campaign of the 21st century, and every single one of those emails that you get is from an individual person who is opposed to what you're doing. So if you want the opposition to stop, you have to stop doing what you're doing for animals. We do everything we can every day at PETA to try to help the animals, but your voice is such a critical, integral part to that. We would not have the successes that we've talked about tonight at all, were it not for all of you. So please sign up for those 
action alerts. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Kathy, I'm afraid that is all the time we have, so I believe you have a final message for our listeners. Yes, thank you again for all those terrific questions. As Ben mentioned at the beginning of the town hall, if we didn't have time to get to yours, we'll get in touch with you about it in the next few days and get you an answer. If you're on the phone right now, I have a quick favor to ask of you. You can stay on the line, if you would, please, after we sign off to share your gratitude for the men and the women of PETA Foundation's legal team for the many groundbreaking victories we've discussed today. And we also welcome your comments and suggestions for future town hall topics. Thank you again for your support of our work and everything you do to make a difference in the lives of animals. Thank you, Kathy. This concludes today's town hall meeting. I do hope you'll join us again on June 29th for our next town hall, where we'll discuss how you can help the many animals who are right now being killed for their fur, skins, and feathers. Thank you once again for joining us, and have a good evening.